Hi, Jeremy. Welcome. So good to see you again after this summit last year. Yeah, yeah. So, so great to see you both. Uh, uh, I'm excited to have another conversation right now. Thank you. Absolutely. How have you been since then? What has um, changed? What is new? Oh, well, you know, actually for me, quite frankly, um, a lot of my focus has been about uh, just getting this new book, The Web of Meaning, ready uh, for production. It's in its final stages of proofing right now. It's coming out in June of this year. And so a lot of my time is focused on that, but also just as much on this vision of an ecological civilization, which is really, uh, and it seems to really get traction among people. And I'm doing actually a, a four part um, class, a, s a series of four classes, which has been quite popular uh, really going deeply into this vision, what's possible as an ecological civilization. So that's been my, what my life's been about. Yeah, which, which brings us to this uh, book. And I reached out to you and I, I'm really excited and looking forward to the web of meaning because you know how much your work, the patterning instinct influenced um, me. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and your coining of this concept of cognitive history and tracing uh, how, how we've developed in the world through the way humans have made meaning about the experiences that we've had. And I know we'll get a little bit into that, but yeah, you recently uh, wrote, co-authored a book called The New Possible. Um, it was just a, a couple of weeks ago, it came out, not so, Jeremy? That's right, exactly. So it's just, it's really doing its launch right now as we speak. Yeah, and so, you know, that's why I reached out to you to have the conversation again. And because I know that um, you're also bringing out the web of meaning, as you said. But mm -hmm. so how did you get involved in this? The new, the name of this book is The New Possible. And what are, what are you all hoping to achieve through this um, yeah. book? The New Possible Visions yeah. of Our <clears throat> World Beyond the Crisis. Right, I, I would think the, the title obviously speaks so much about what it's, it's all about. Um, and uh, it was actually a collaboration between two organizations that are both um, uh, uh, really visionary and I'm excited about both. One is called One Project, which has been um, founded by somebody who actually was, had been one of the very successful Silicon Valley tech entrepreneurs uh, who just realized that a lot of the work he was doing um, he was responsible for things like the Facebook thumbs up uh, right. button, things like that. And it, the, he, a lot of his work was invested in bringing people together and he realized it had been hijacked by this great capitalist machine. So now he's really devoted his time to put an organization together to actually get that sense of true oneness among humanity that he had hopefully, he had thought he was investing in, in technology. And the other group, is actually the um, Institute for Ecological Civilization, which is one that I've uh, gotten very excited about because of my own um, passionate commitment to that vision. So they asked me to basically uh, do like the introductory chapter to that book, which is basically spells out the vision of an ecological civilization. But what's so exciting about the book itself is it's got so many amazing, prominent leading thinkers from such different fields uh, to actually share their visions of, of what's possible. People, I'm sure many people know some of these names like Michael Pollan, uh, mm -hmm. Vandana Shiva, Manfele Ramfele, uh, Helena Norberg, Hodge David Corton, and um, Tristan Harris, who many people might know um, now if they've seen that documentary about um, the dangers of the social media. Uh, mm -hmm. that came out on Netflix recently. And so um, people are giving these perspectives of different ways of thinking about what's possible. And that's what I think is huge, is this recognition. It's not just about economics. It's not just about law. It's not just about any one area, but it's about a whole integrated weave of new ways of thinking. Yeah. Like you're, you're talking about, like you mentioned a couple of things, different way of thinking. And then before you mentioned oneness, is the goal or the objective to bring us all on the same level to a wavelength or is it more or less being mindful of all the diversity that we bring into the space yeah. which one is it yeah i think that's a, a a great question Anya, and thank you for that and um yeah i was saying that about um more about the founder of one project justin rosenstein 
Um, and personally, I like to talk about the concept of integration, which to me is crucial. And when we're thinking about different ways of relating to our civilization and our human experience, because we can think of our current society as being really based on separations, you know, separations between humans and nature, separations from each other, separation of spiritual and scientific, all these things, all these very hardcore separations. But the oneness, get, people can get very kind of turned off by that overall concept for one reason being just what you raised. They go, well, one is, it doesn't necessarily make sense. We're not all one. There are differences. And just as importantly, we should celebrate those differences. Mm -hmm. It's not like we don't want to be all one. We don't want to be um, just kind of part of the so boring. Like, um, and that's what I love about this notion of integration, because um, it's this concept that's actually coined really well by um, somebody called Dan Siegel, who's a founder of the field of interpersonal neurobiology. He talked yeah. about integration as being really um, unity with differentiation. So integration captures both of those things in one. And in fact, um, if you look at the way organisms work, if you look at the way nature works, it's all about integration. If you look at our bodies, you know, every cell um, that we have in our bodies, all 40 trillion of them, and um, share the same DNA, but they also um, separate it. They do their own things. And they're, so they're part of a system while they're different and unique. And you see that in an ecosystem, fully integrated. Each part has a part to play in the bigger overall healthy system by doing its unique thing. And that's the beauty of integration, this recognition that we can celebrate diversity as, and recognize that at another level, we are all part of one whole. We're all part of humanity. And as humanity, we're all part of life. And, and this underpins the work that you're doing and it underpins your chapter in The New Possible. It seems like the foundational philosophy for this ecological civilization that you are proposing. Could you, for the viewers who don't know what you mean by that, could you explain a little bit about this ecological civilization? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, the idea of an ecological civilization in simple terms is to envisage what our society, our human society could be like if we actually looked at some of nature's own principles that uh, allowed nature to develop ecosystems, ecologies that can last in health and resilience for millions and millions of years and through all kinds of perturbations with the exception maybe of human impact right now, unfortunately. But um, evolved over billions of years on earth certain kind of secrets um, to how to interact and and so the inspiration is what happens if we look at nature's own secrets and try to apply them to our own society um, and what I something I love about an ecological civilization is it gets away from some of these past uh, dichotomies that have gotten so stale you know we can look at the whole 20th century really politically as being all about sort of capitalism versus communism or socialism. And so it's always right versus left or free market versus the collective and all these kind of things. And it's every time people come up with new ideas, it's so easy to get pigeonholed and you're back in the same old arguments and people say, well, look what happened with Soviet Union. That didn't go so well. Um, all that stuff, the lovely thing about this vision of an ecological civilization and so much work that is being done by people around the world in different areas mm -hmm. is that it leaves behind that old divide. Um, there were just as many bad things about communism as there have been about capitalism. And there's good things about both. And what an ecological civilization does is says, let's start again, looking at what actually could work for humanity. Um, and so an example of the kind of secrets that nature has that we're talking about and probably the most important of all um, is this notion of mutually beneficial symbiosis. You know, we've been told uh, by people like Richard Dawkins and uh, a lot of the um, contemporary ideas 
that we as sort of pseudoscience, if you will, because modern biology has shown these to be incorrect. But people have got to think that nature is all about competitiveness and selfish genes and every creature is out to um, get at the other creature. And even when they're cooperative, it's just because they're being, they're just using it as a tactic because ultimately it's all about selfish genes. Actually, uh, what evolutionary biology shows us is that the great steps in evolution from when life first began on Earth have all been about different organisms working out how to be mutually beneficially symbiotic with others, where each is a specialist at one particular thing, and then they work together to create a whole that is more successful, richer than, the, than they could ever be as separate parts. And, Wait, and so that's that one what we can learn for human society. Does that suggest that we actually have a really good shared understanding of what are the resources that we are, you know, having the shared resources? Because when you say symbiosis, that means that if we are part of the same system, that means that I use it, but not on behalf of you or not as um, in a way that would actually harm you. Um, but we really know and we share the information just how much resources there is that I can spend and how much resources I need to share with you. Is that a demand that or almost like a predisposition that we make an assumption that we make when we say that we are, you know, sharing the same ecosystem, sharing the same planet and that we can actually leave as the ec ecological civilization? Yeah, I think um, part of it is clearly to recognize that we, we're in a system which is basically based on exploitation. Mm -hmm. And so the system is, uh, from a global uh, scenario, the system is, uh, is all about um, what capitalism basically says is, how can we exploit natural resources as rapidly as possible and people who have the capital, that, I mean, this is the underlying basis of the system, the people under have the capital um, uh, try to use their capital to exploit other human beings as effectively as possible to make more money on their capital. And so everything is structured as this balance um, it, within this kind of zero sum game. And so uh, if, you are, if you're somebody who doesn't have the capital, then the only way you can be a part of the system is by selling your own lifeblood, essentially, your own energy and time um, in order to uh, be able to eat or have housing because the mm -hmm. system is designed that way. Um, and so the, and similarly with, uh, in terms of uh, looking at the rest of the living earth, it's viewed as a resource. Like how can we mine the resources as quickly as possible? How can we turn natural abundance into stuff that could be part of that market economy? So what um, the notion of an ecological civilization is about shifting the whole way we looking at human relationships and the whole way we look at human relationships with the living earth. So if we relate to how we are with Earth uh, symbiotically, it would be not about how can we exploit it as much as possible, but how can we um, get what nature is contributing to us? How can we receive that in a way that actually allows nature to also flourish um, and, and, and by the way, it, it'll enable that uh, to contribute more to us in the future. So it's kind of a win-win. It turns that zero-sum game into a win-win. And similarly in human society, um, rather than being capital versus labor, it moves more towards things like worker-owned co-ops or more, or even more profoundly towards commons as a, as a form of organizing so that people actually are part of their very ownership structure. And it's like being part of the community and, and, uh, and forces people and enables them to be responsible for how the resources get shared and to make sure they're there for the long term. You know, Jeremy, these conversations are happening all over the world. We are seeing, you know, more and more organizations, communities, thought leaders like yourself, writing, sharing, having these discussions about how we can create a better future. Um, and actually doing initiatives, creating initiatives. They're also entrepreneurs and social leaders who are creating initiatives. Um, but I mean, the elephant in the room, I think, is our political governance systems and our political leadership. And the question is, can we from the bottom up create these changes if our political leaders don't get on board 
with the shifts mm -hmm. that the vast majority of people are, are starting to see that we need to do. I mean, what are nature's secrets for our democracy? What are nature's secrets for yeah. our political yeah. system? Well, yeah, I think that you are definitely looking at the right thing there in terms of that elephant in the room. I would just um, maybe suggest rephrasing it slightly in terms of like, uh, more like power dynamics, because it's even goes beyond politics in the sense that uh, another, even maybe in my view, even more gigantic elephant in the room is the power of the transnational corporations, uh, which who, if, oftentimes when we think about politics, we think about party politics or whatever, and yeah. we miss the, the mm. fact that the actual power behind most of what goes on uh, are these massive for-profit corpora corporations. Right. And in fact, if you look at the 100 mm. largest economies in the world today, most of them are not even countries. 69 of those 100 are transnational corporations. They're the ones that basically drive the discussions at the UN, that they, they own our media. So they, they control what we think. Uh, they own all kinds of everything around finance. So sources of capital to do anything they own. And they well buy as, policies. And they buy policies, exactly. So um, really, so politics, yes, but it's more like those power dynamics and, yeah. and party politics we think of as just kind of one more puppet uh, within that overall power dynamic. But it comes back to your question. How do we, what do we do about that if it's so powerful? Uh -huh. And I think the first thing we need to do, honestly, is just be aware of the elephant in the room in the, in the sense that it's so powerful and it's so massive that much of the time we spend just sort of not even looking at that because it's just too big. And we look at, well, how can we work within this system to make it a little, little bit better? And oftentimes people will say, well, how can we try to make the corporation a little bit more humane or get them to do more good things or um but if if you're a corporation and you're driven by um having to maximize shareholder profits at mm -hmm. all costs that basically um the the irony is that in the united states corporations are called persons um, and they have the legal uh, power and privilege of persons but if they were human persons they would be psychopaths because a psychopath is somebody who is only concerned about one thing, their own goal, and they have no empathic, no compassion, no morality about whatever happens in order to get that goal. And that is what a corporation basically in its DNA is about. So we have to recognize that. And that's rarely talked about, partly because the corporations themselves own the distribution of information too. Wait, but um, I'm just going to slightly challenge yeah. that because I am aware of the new corporativism and it's not the first time that we've actually came across this notion. Um, the corporations sure are now biggest than ever. And, you know, it's to my view actually absurd to know that the World Health Organization is actually in the you know, hands of Bill Gates, for example. Mm -hmm. So it is becoming very interesting to observe all these new power dynamics, but to some extent, can't we believe that perhaps, you know, whomever holds the power in their hands when it comes to the global perspective, maybe it's the notion of the nation states that is kind of becoming obsolete, just like the monarchs have become obsolete in the 17th century. And it's now about to, um, you know, radically cha change the game. So maybe it's going to be up to the corporations to become responsible for our social wealth. Would that be one way to go about, or should we um, make yeah, well, it could be, the I, enemy? I do agree that the nation state system is um, moving into the past. It's really not how our future could or should be structured, basically. They were, as you say, just really um, the re results of power politics in Europe over a few hundred years. It's not like the natural way in which society should be structured in any respect. And I do think they've been weakening. The question is what takes over their power? Um, and many people actually uh, look at cities as being the source of much more of the sort of um, people driven power as we move forward. That's where um, like by the middle of the century, I think 70% of uh, people on earth will be living in cities. And um, that's very much we, where we find a lot of the ideas and that are much more grassroots oriented because somebody who's like the mayor of a city, for example, um, 
you're have to you're dealing with the hardcore reality on the ground of people's lives, what they're actually going through. So you're much closer to the lived reality rather than this this kind of idea of a nation state. Um, but to your other point, uh, I don't. You're uh, looking at corporations; they're not going to be going away anytime soon. And there's I'm not. Um, there may even be a very significant mm. role for these gigantic, big transnational corporations of some kind in any kind of future. Because if we think again about nature as an ecosystem, there are some species that are that are very huge and loom big in the system. Some species are a niche. You have elephants and you have tiny little um, dung beetles and everything in between. So it's not like everything should be uh, one size fits all. So I think to your point is, um, the hopeful thing is we can actually change the DNA of these corporations. If we, and I'm sure people are probably familiar with this notion of um, what are called uh, B corporations. And there's another thing as, as a, a certification uh, a, for a benefit corporation. And the notion behind those is that to change the actual charter of a corporation, to say it has to be uh, focus not just on profit, but also uh, sometimes called triple bottom line, not just profit, but people and planet. Now, right now, that's had almost infinitesimal impact on the world because any large corporation has simply not chosen this voluntary this and shift voluntary. towards that triple bottom line. But just imagine if it became, uh, if the nations as a, as a group, some of the largest nations agreed that they were changing the corporate charter rules so the corporations could only keep being chartered if they actually met those triple bottom lines. And if the decision about whether they did or not was made not by just some corrupt panel of like ex-corporate uh, sort of executives who were just hanging together, but actually through sortition, through people, um, actual workers or people who lived in communities where those corporations were, or people who lived on the land where corporations were expressed, as a group had to determine whether they actually were meeting those bottom lines and therefore whether they could even allow to be continuing to be in business. That one change, which is a massive change, but also it's a change that's very imaginable. It just requires lines of text in, um, in law, basically. That would change the DNA of those corporations okay. overnight. For sure, and so that, that is what we in Future Law would call a high leverage strategic intervention point right. in the law, if we could get that into the law. But then you buck up against the point that I raised before, the political system, the, right. the process by which policies become law and the obstacles in that process. And at the end of the day, the relationship between the political leadership and lawmaking is something that we cannot avoid. You know, so um, yeah, I, I think for me, once we continue for, focusing on voluntary self-regulation while for these corporations and in these industries whilst it's good and I you know I support it and I think we really should do it um, I don't know if it's going to get us there fast enough given the imperatives that are upon us right now um, with the IPCC uh, reports and, and, and all that we are seeing with the climate and, and the human rights injustices and the oppression and the structural inequalities that exist right now. I don't know if we can go fast enough relying on voluntary um, self-regulation of these companies. So we keep coming back to, you know, how do we get these laws changed, you know? Right, yeah, I, I hear you. And thank you for bringing us back to that, that key point. And I think that this is where we can learn another lesson actually from ecosystems and from ecology. And there's this uh, really profound understanding of how, um, again, any living system works, whether it's our own body or an ecosystem. And it's what's called reciprocal causality, which basically means that a system works through the, the system as a whole, affecting all the different parts of the system. Mm -hmm. And all the different parts of the system together actually are, are driving and creating that system as a whole. So um, if you focus on just one and not the other, you kind of miss the yeah. true integrative way in which a system works. So if we think about how that, what that means for my own body or whatever, you know, um, my, my body as a whole is always saying, um, I'm, 
it's kind of maintaining homeost homeostasis or determining right. we need this or we need that or I should be thinking now or I, um, I have these me metabolic needs, whatever it is. But the parts of my body are the ones actually working together to send out those signals, which then the system as a whole gets to recognize and, uh, and directs accordingly. So if we apply that to our, system, our need for change yeah. and what you're pointing out quite correctly, that top level system as a whole, the, that party politics kind of thing is not working, it's broken. Um, and it's just allowing us to move towards destruction. So this is where if we, we need to focus the attention on what has been left out of that, which is the grassroots, which is this notion of self-organization among different people, among groups. And that's where cities can play a part, but also just communities working together um, looking at making those changes happen and actually doing that in a way where it becomes <clears throat> actually part of that overall system. So it's not, in a, in, it's not separate from it and it's not attacking that overall system, but it's actually changing that overall system from within. And that can be done through um, organizing in commons form basis like yeah. actual businesses. It can be done through actual political grassroots representation. There's a, a group in the UK called Alternative UK, um, yeah. which of course, you, you know, Indra Adnan is a, a, a co-founder of it, um, who are doing a great job of identifying where these grassroots changes are taking place and helping them to sort of move, yeah. get together to actually make these kind of profound changes happen. That's what we need, um, but not again, instead of, it doesn't yeah. work to just say, uh, hell, forget about that no. party politics. We have to do it as part of that process. And that's the beauty of what um, Indra Adnan with Alternative UK is trying to do. Um, and she was at our summit as well, along with the Negotiating New Normal last mm -hmm. year. If you all haven't seen the recordings, uh, go to www fli-x.com, flicks.com, get access to those recordings. But that's the really, um, I thought, really exciting thing about the work of Indra Adnan and Alternative UK. It's not just about organizing uh, uh, at a community level. It's not community organizing. There is a clear um, integration that she is doing between the community organizing and the political process. Mm -hmm. and helping creating a bridge between the two. First, they are doing it on, for themselves and their communities, but then also that bridge building is taking place. And um, so, yeah, I, I think that I, I agree with you. I, 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 it, it makes absolute sense the way you speak. And I can see from how you speak that you're coming from a place of system science. You are, mm -hmm. you know, referencing these, the, you know, systems thinking. Um, just as an aside, just for those who are looking on and, and just want to continue to follow, how do you, what, what resources have you been reading and, and paying attention to, to really be able to understand the world through this systemic lens? Are yeah, what well, resources you would point um, to? One uh, book that just came out last year that I would strongly recommend. Um, is by David Bullier, B-O-L-L-I-E-R. It's called Free, Fair, and Alive. And um, he is somebody who spent years and years, a uh, big chunk of his life, looking at the commons as a different way of organizing. And it's more, what he does in, in that book, he shows how thinking in terms of the commons is very, goes way beyond just saying, oh, let's start this business, but rather than it being shareholder owned, let's have all of us own it together and have a cooperative or something like that. It's more like what he calls um, an onto shift yeah. or an ontological shift in how we relate to each other and the natural world in how we actually conduct our enterprises. And so sort of thinking like a commoner, as he calls it, or living like a commoner is a whole different way of being in the world and being with others and thinking about how we take responsibility for what we do in shared community. Um, and I think that that kind of thinking is a sort of radical rethinking going from um, a profound uh, way of understanding something to actual actions in the real world. He, he by the way, was one of the 
contributors to the book, The New Possible. Yeah. And so it just as, a, as another plug for that or whatever. So that's one uh, way of thinking. And then the, the, another really great way of thinking comes from the author Roman Krasnarek, um, who wrote a book that actually just came out in paperback um, just this week uh, called The Good Ancestor. And um, what he comes up with is this different way of thinking about where we're situated in the whole unfolding of the past, the present and the future. And mm -hmm. recognizing that we need to think about the future, not like this kind of unknown uh, territory, but actually as this place that has rights. And when we look at just things like discounting, which is something that any business thinks is doing a sensible thing when it makes a business decision, what discount rate do you apply? And when you look at your cash flows, what discounting basically does is it says essentially that future generations have less value than our own generation. It essentially uh, eliminates them from consideration as people worthy of having the benefits of a life that we think for ourselves or our own children or something like that. Um, so it's, again, it's a very different way of thinking about life with very practical um, implications. Um, that's another recommendation I'd make. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to move to the new book that you have coming out in June. Um, I mean, you have done this really significant contribution. I always like to have your books next to me when I'm talking to you. The Patterning Instinct, if you haven't gotten it, mm -hmm. it's available on Amazon. It um, really helps us to understand the cultural metaphors that have gotten us here um, and uh, pointing the way toward uh, new metaphors that can help us to navigate going forward. I, I wonder if you could just give us um, just the a little brief synopsis about this book, The Patterning Instinct, and where you are taking it now with this follow on the web of meaning. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Margaret. Um, well, so the that book, The Patterning Instinct, uh, its subtitle is actually a cultural history of humanity's search for meaning. And so what the book is actually is essentially as a history book or like a cognitive history book, um, looking at how all the way from earliest hunter gatherer times to the present day, the, the ways in which um, people have patterned meaning into the universe actually leads to the values their culture has. And uh, what is so powerful to recognize is that those values have actually shaped the course of history. So it's not just um, the simple fact of people who got lucky or happened to live in a certain area where they could get more power is what uh, drove history, but it's ideas, the sense of what is right, what is the thing to do, um, is what led, for example, to the West, uh, essentially taking a, a kind of a mindset of exploitation um, and the, their reason to exist is to, is to exploit and to be powerful over nature and over others. That led to this um, unstable, uh, reckless destruction path that we're on right now. So that book looks at all these different ways of patterning meaning from the earliest times to the present and with a hint to the future. This new book, The Web of Meaning, is essentially a sequel to The Patterning Instinct because if The Patterning Instinct was historical, what the web of meaning looks at is uh, offering a worldview and a set of values coming from that that could actually lead to a redirection of our path as humanity to a flourishing future rather than this future of destruction that we're headed on right now. Um, and so you can think of the web of meaning really as that underlying metaphor for a worldview of deep interconnectedness with the realization that meaning itself arises from our, in, from our connectedness, actually. Meaning is a function of connectedness. And it looks at the fundamental questions that humans all ask, these core existential questions like, who am I? Where am I? Um, how should I live? Why am I? And in each case, it shows how our modern culture 
and it gives us answers to those questions that are not only dangerous, driving us to this precipice, but are plain wrong. They're based on outmoded 17th century ideas from the European scientific revolution or some other ideas developed in the 19th century. And modern science, um, actually over the last few decades, has shown those to be wrong and has pointed us to the same insights that some of the great wisdom traditions of the world, indigenous traditions, Taoist and Buddhist traditions have been pointing us to for millennia, which is the recognition of our deep interconnectedness as a foundation for values and for making sense of the world. Wow, uh, there is so many questions that, that you just opened. Um, like one thing that I was hearing was that we are trying to establish a new worldview and redirect the people and then talking about the value systems and what is right and what is wrong and you know giving the answers to all these people I don't want to be secular or anything but having it compared to Buddhism, Buddhism and all the rest of the religions are we now talking about establishing a new religion or I mean is that what is being proposed on the table well even even the word religion is um, a problematic concept. In a way, it's something that, um, like so many things that we take for granted, it's something that kind of was an idea that got developed in the West for the most part um, with a particular meaning. Like if you, um, if you were to uh, talk to, uh, say, a nomadic hunter-gatherer from thousands of years ago and you said, what religion do you have? Mm. They'd say, I don't know, what are you talking about? You mm -hmm. say, well, how do you make sense of the world? And, it, and after conversation, say, oh, well, of course, everything's, everything's related. We're all related. But what's that got to do with religion? So, I mean, the very notion of religion creates the sense of separation, that there's stuff that's religious and there's stuff that is secular and not, not sacred. And what I'm trying to look at in this concept of this deep interconnectedness and an integrative way of making sense of the world is that actually um, what, what we lead to is that everything is sacred. So we don't need to think of it as some sort of new religion that we need. But what we do need to um, think of it as a way of, in, if you will, kind of um, bringing back to our daily lives a sense of the sacred, um, a sense that there, there is not, it's not like we sort of, um, we should all be, we were praying to some God, now we should pray to another God or something like that. It's this recognition that our, our lives themselves, life itself, is what deserves reverence. And we can actually um, apply that by living a life of meaning in all the different ways that actually are life affirming. So it's sort of like, like so many things uh, that the book kind of looks at, our Western way of making sense of them is always comes down to being based on these separations between things, but there's a different way of living our life that actually integrates it all instead. I had to ask because I always perceive the religion, um, especially um, Christianity, for example, entering the space where I live, Slovenia, and you know the Balkan area, as being the one that actually separated a human being from the earth, and then establishing new value system. Um, and this is how we became very disconnected from the old beliefs and mm. from being connected to the nature around us, and really just being. Um, focused on how the revenue system works and how the distribution of the um, resource that, that we have um, functions and really becoming just a part of the system that somebody else imposed on us. So maybe just to paraphrase the question that I had before, uh, not really focusing on this uh, being a new religion, but really is it that we as human beings, because the system is now falling apart, basically, do, do we need a new belief or maybe many new beliefs uh, do we need to create new rituals um, or do, do we need to perform different, how, how do we establish that mm. new system, new, you know, yeah. options that we so, so much desire? Yeah, yeah, thanks Anya, I see where you're going in that and I, th yeah, these are really wonderful questions to sort of do some deep inquiry into. I think the simple answer is yes, but the complex answer is well, what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. um, and to just touch on that, that first thing that you said is about um, what, what you were describing about that sort of desacralization of the world that religion did, I think is absolutely true for monotheism. 
basically. If you look historically, monotheism that said there's a God up there in the heavens and the rest of the world is therefore only has value based on what that God up there tells us. Uh, it, it's both, it's very patriarchal because it anthropomorphizes this God as being this kind of male patriarchal figure and it separates holiness from our lived existence from the world below. And, and so that's what we see in monotheism. You actually don't see that, for example, in Vedic tradition in India. You don't see that in Buddhism. You, it, there are some parts of Buddhism that actually does that to some degree, but a lot of Buddhism does the opposite and, uh, and does not look for some sort of external source of meaning. And you don't see that in, in traditional Chinese uh, um, ways of making sense like Taoism. Uh, but I think to your point, the, I, even more important than that is the fact that as humans, we need the sense of ritual. We need a sense of meaning in what we're doing. And we need that actually as part of community. So if you actually look at the roots of the word religion itself, it actually comes from the root meaning to tie or to tie together or bind together. Um, in a, and that's meant in a positive way, meaning that we feel tied together with community, with other people or with life around us. Um, and uh, at least that, that was what I think why the word originally originated in that form, um, as opposed to being bound up, which you could also interpret in a different way. But um, so I think that we do need to find new rituals. Um, and there are lots of groups around there in the world that are relating back to indigenous cultures, to um, learning from them. Um, but that has to be done very carefully because it's very easy if you come from this kind of Western mindset <clears throat> to then um, really look extractively at indigenous cultures and like, oh, what can we gain from them? And how can we use that for our purposes rather than to really reverentially hear what indigenous cultures have to tell us and to tread very lightly and then um, try to learn how we can apply these findings to a future way of living our life with more meaning. And so uh, I think it's, it's very valid to try to look at how we can develop new rituals, new ways of relating together um, in ways that actually touch into essentially the sacredness of our human heart, the sacredness of community and the sacredness of life. Mm -hmm. And I just, the, your, the book that you're writing, Web of Meaning, or that is coming out, you've completed it. It's, right. uh, you've completed it, yeah. Um, is it that you are telling a story of what you see emerging as uh, the new meaning and new values that we are go moving toward? Or are you, Jeremy Lent, uh, making a case for the new meaning and the new values that we should hold if we want to protect our future and the rights of the future and-, and, and Yeah, that, that is a, a, a great question, Margaret. And I've <clears throat> tried to be very aware of the fact that um, here am I uh, basically a white male from the global North uh, talking about how we need different ways of relating and understanding things when it's the very, it's those very white males from European descent who have been the ones who have um, given us all this, um, this imbalance and uh, these problems we have right now. So uh, I, I think that's something for me to just be aware of and to be sensitive to. And in this book, what I really have tried above all to uh, play the role of is more, uh, is, uh, it's actually called the web of meaning. And I've kind of been more seeing myself as a weaver, if you will, of the, um, intersecting, uh, interconnecting um, different areas of great wisdom and brilliance all, all around me that I've spent years and years of my life reading and researching, not in some sense of saying like, oh, I've got the answer. I'm the new white savior that's going to like uh, bring the, um, the answers to the world, but kind of the opposite in a way saying, um, here are people who have had in terms of wisdom traditions, people who have had these great insights for millennia. Um, and here are people in the scientific uh, fields for the last few decades who've had 
also great insights, whether it's in ethology, discovering um, the emotions and complexity of animals, or even discovering the intelligence within single cells or in plant life. And then other people in cognitive uh, anthropology who discovered that what makes us hu as humans as humans is our ability to cooperate, not to compete with each other. That's actually what really identifies us among other primates. And in each of these cases, you have this, or and system scientists recognizing that it's the ways in which things interrelate that is oftentimes more important than the things themselves. So I see my role more as getting, looking at all these great insights from the past and from the present and kind of weaving them together so that people who are expert in one area can recognize that what they're saying relates to something in a very different area that they might not have realized um, was speaking to the same language that they are. So hopefully that's been my role more than anything as kind of facilitator of those interconnections of all those great brilliant insights that I certainly don't claim, claim credit for myself. Yeah, and, and I believe in you, Jeremy. I've, I've read your but book. I, I know thank that's you for what you do. Raising that, that question, it's a, I think it's an important one. And, and it, it leads to another. It leads to what I would call um, justice, transitional justice on these issues, because we, the future that we paint and that you paint, in uh, the work that you did with us at the summit toward an ecological civilization and seeing the new possible and what you're talking about in the web of meaning. I, I think most people, regardless of their background, their culture, uh, just an assumption I'm making, most people will look at it and say, yes, this is a future that we want to be a part of. The concern, however, is how do we get there in a way that is fair and just. And I just want to give you an example of one of the issues we're dealing with in our um, community in future law that we have to grapple with because of the multinational um, reach of our community. And we're dealing with the crime of ecocide. Mm -hmm. And we think that that certainly is a leverage point for change, um, criminalizing destruction of the uh, massive destruction of the earth. Um, However, there's the, that relationship between the criminalization of ecocide and the economic um, growth of countries um, that are now investing heavily, late industrialized countries that are now investing heavily in fossil fuels and see the fossil fuels as a way out. So I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. We invest heavily in fossil fuels next door. Just last year and, and year before, Guyana, massive oil find. They're saying it's one of the biggest in the world. They're going, they, they, they've found oil. And they are very committed to getting that oil and going heavily into that industry. Um, and uh, they see it as a means of elevating their people out of poverty and improving the quality of life and all of that. So um, we, how, do you, how do we manage a just transition when the argument is, and, and we've had those arguments advanced in our community um, from people in Nigeria and other countries that um, no, uh, the, the countries in the global north benefited from this. They're the ones that messed up the, you know, the pollution and the environment. And now, you know, they want to stop us from being able to stand on our own two feet. Mm -hmm. You know, one of um, the uh, scholars, Hajun Chang says they're kicking away the ladder, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a new type of kicking away the ladder. Now this mm -hmm. fight against the fossil fuel. And so uh, Jeremy, do you have thoughts on how we um, navigate in a just way Mm -hmm. toward this new civilization that you speak of? Yes, absolutely. And I think everything you are speaking to is absolutely right on the mark. And, and what we need to realize is these the transformative changes have to happen in the global north. They have to be, uh, we have to recognize that the global north is roughly like 20% of the human population uh, have used historically and are currently using roughly 80% of the resources and are responsible overwhelmingly for the destructive 
uh, path that we're on right now. And those changes have to happen in the global north. And in fact, um, just by the by, uh, to make a, a plug for one more book that I would recommend people take a close look at um, by Jason Hickel, yeah. um, H-I-C-K-E-L, called Less is More, uh, which just came out fairly recently. And um, he makes, he really explains so clearly how it's not about, um, just like it was untrue years ago, that neoliberal myth that um, basically a rising tide uh, helps all kind of thing, complete bullshit, of course, the opposite was true. Similarly, um, it's not true to say, oh, we all need to um, equally kind of reduce what we're doing. No, the opposite is true. The global north is absolutely way out of whack and needs to transform our, um, our consumption oriented behavior, need to transform our ways of living everything has to be moved radically. People in a lot of countries in the global south actually need further increase in their material throughput in order to have uh, just the basics that they need for a, a, a flourishing life, which actually leads me to one more plug for yet another book, um, uh, Donut Economics by Kate oh, Rayworth, sure, that sure. I'm sure many people know, which really structures this way of thinking very clearly. The whole concept of the donut yeah. is that there's a minimal, um, which is the minimal amount uh, of, um, of different material goods that people need for a, that have any basis for a life of well-being whether it's minimal amount of housing or food security or access to water or avoidance of pollution, all those things. And there is a maximum amount. The outside of that donut shape is the amount um, that we have to stay within our global limits. Otherwise, we're basically blowing up this uh, beautiful earth for everybody. So the goal is to live within that donut. Um, and it's just as important for people who's, and for societies who are in the below amount to be able to raise their quality of living, which involves raising their material quality of living too. Um, and while those who are way outside of it have to bring it down. So I think there are not, it's not the same rule for all by any means. And so, um, and, and I think that ultimately we have to look at, again, at the underlying drivers of these systems. So when you have a country in the global South that is forced, for example, to make debt payments um, yeah. for um, which are these absurd uh, debts that got brought decades ago because of the ways in which the dollar worked against their currency and because of other uh, like elements of corruption and power politics decades ago. But now they're still having to and, make and and those because debts. and because of buying their freedom from slavery, for example, Haiti. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Exactly. And then having to pay interest on those debts. Those are the kinds of things that have to be fundamentally changed. Um, so that, of course, if I'm uh, somebody in, in French Guyana or whatever, and the only way I can make those payments, or the only way I can afford to buy food overinflated in the global markets for my people is to sell the, the, uh, the petroleum, I'm not going to have a lot of options. The systems themselves have to be looked at and revamped. Is your president, your new president and vice president, do you think they have the uh, vision and the will to do some of the radical reorganizing that you are suggesting? Yeah. Frankly, no. Um, I don't think they have the vision or the will to do that kind of radical reorganization. But that's not to say that they don't have a very good role to play right now. Yeah, for Our, sure. They are uh, doing the United a lot States, of... of course, as we know, um, is still, I mean, even though uh, the election <laughs> results were uh, just by a tiny amount, like uh, uh, allowed democracy to continue, there's this real risk of this this crazed country just falling apart, even now, mm -hmm. uh, where you have the one of the two major parties basically coming out explicitly against democracy for violence, authoritarianism, and yeah. essentially fascism. Um, so it's a very, it's a terrifying time. And I do think that there's a part to play for people like President Biden and, and, uh, and Vice President Kamala Harris and others to offer a sense of reassurance, a sense of what's possible, looking back to 
some of the traditions in the United States that while they were flawed, were at least a lot better than um, brutal, brutal fascism. So they have a part to play and I support them strongly in doing that. But we need to recognize that the very best case of what they can do um, is to just bring uh, the United States back into some kind of mainstream orientation. Um, and we're not going to see from them the kind of vision that we need to transform the world into a life affirming future. We have to, we have to both support uh, people in roles like that because they are at least uh, reducing the harm or the, the brutality yeah, that yeah. we have to fear. And at the same time, just gently prod the whole system. Um, and when I say gently, I don't mean uh, softly, uh, like, uh, but it has to be done in such a way that the system, rather than resisting, actually wants to move along with that transformative change to um, much bigger changes in the future. Hearing you saying that on the presidency, the new presidency, and just previously speaking of the cities, kind of gave me an idea that we might actually be running the politics for decades now in the direction of just providing the power to the nation states instead of actually looking what's beneath it or what really links us all together um, and thinking about the assemblies of all these cities on a global level. We kind of thought, yeah, sure, let's create these assemblies and let's call them, you know, the presidents or the prime ministers and let's create the United Nations. But I can't help the feeling that what you're suggesting is more or less going very much local instead of going so global um, and having all these little fragments put together. Sure, going complex and going big, but really just, you know, focusing on the individual or the, the smaller particles of our society. Um, and I'm uh, just figuring it out all out while I speak. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. so. no, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And um, uh, again, sort of coming from that sort of systems perspective, um, and the, the difficulty with, with what I'm saying is I'm always, I'm offering answers that are complex and not necessarily the easiest things to do, but it's a matter of, of actually, yes, focusing very much at that local grassroots level and maintaining an, an awareness of that global um, overall um, structural level at the same time and letting those flows between the two be as seamless as possible. And so again, to that notion of that reciprocal causality, all the parts affecting the whole and the whole affecting the parts. And so a lot of what is wrong in our uh, political system right now is the focus is on the whole affecting the parts, but not on the parts mm -hmm. affecting the mm -hmm. whole, which is why reorienting towards the local, reorienting to people we actually relate to and where we can actually see people at least post COVID face to face, um, but actually share in, in community with people. And um, that is essential. We have to sort of reorient yeah. to that. But there's a danger that people can use that as a way to sort of bypass some of the bigger issues. Um, it's easy for people to say, well, okay, it's all messed up out there. I'm gonna focus on my community. We're gonna do really good things. We're going to um, you know, build uh, resilience and um, all good stuff and no complaints about that. But it um, can sometimes lead to people then shutting off mm -hmm. those global system issues, systemic issues and saying, well, I'm doing my part. No, that's not mm -hmm. enough. Not enough. Um, we're, we're in a, a major crisis right now and it, it calls a lot from each of us. Mm -hmm. So from each of us, we have to both go local and global, like that notion of cosmo-local or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Indra mm -hmm. Adnan yeah. again. Yeah. Um, uh, and, we, and we have to recognize we're part of this big system that's right. But not by not by losing that local, but by holding that whole thing in our heads. It's not easy, and I'm not saying it is. But I think that's, um, even though it's not easy, the positive thing I can say about it, it gives a much greater sense of meaning and a sense of integrative um, well-being once we are in that place of flowing between the local and the global, and flowing between essentially, you know, the spiritually meaningful and the eminently practical and things like that, because then that's when we feel like all of us is engaged in making a difference. I hear you. We have to stop 
this conversation because it's just going on and on and on. But there's just one last thing, <laughs> you know, that, you know, I, I keep coming back. You, you, I think, referred to, you know, my um, questioning uh, about pointing to the power dynamics. And, and, and I do think that my preoccupation is there. Um, and, you know, when I think about going local and the cities initiative, and there's quite a huge movement right now with international organizations, transnational corporations um, doing this city initiative to uh, bypassing central government issues because it's so bureaucratic and all of that. And uh, I see a great danger in, uh, in the system as we currently exist in going that route without corrective measures being put in place for the rights of the people on the ground. And one of right. um, our uh, speakers and contributors at the summit, Professor Shruti Pandey from India, um, was speaking about the dangers of this dream smart city, this global city, and how it was impacting um, you know, these uh, citizens in India on the ground. So I, you know, I'm really, the need for us to develop this complexity mindset that I see that you embody, it comes through in all your writings, it has really influenced Anya and I, this complex thinking, how do we think about complex problems in a way where we hold the tension between all of these um, relationships uh, uh, is really the guiding part for us, right? So, you know, I, I, I just think it's, it's, it's challenging and it is only by, I think, having more and more conversations and diverse conversations, conversations where people with differing views come together to try to figure it out um, that, that we will get there. But the point that I'm, taking a long time to try to get out is, I don't know, and, and of course I could be wrong, I don't know if just trying to embody and mimic nature's um, principles and rules, whether that can get us where we need to go when the existing system is so broken, right? Because the power dynamics in the existing system to me may require force in different ways. I'm not necessarily saying violence, but you know, as, as well as these you know, working in nodes and, and the connections and the relationships and holding tension, but it may require some force, um, some destructive force in some ways. And I know that's not a popular view, but um, it, it's, it's what I see. I, I can't see it as an either or. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you so, have any so last his, thoughts here. Yeah. yeah. But it, um, which is a little bit <coughs> to borrow some again, looking to traditional Asian wisdom and to borrow some of the principles of um, practices like Aikido, uh, which um, for those who aren't so familiar with that, Aikido is a martial art, um, but it's a martial art where you don't actually um, impose or push your energy into the opponent, but you allow the opponent's energy to come at you in such in a skillful way so that you can just let them continue on their path and you're staying um, in this place of, of strength or whatever. And I think if we kind of apply, apply this kind of concept to mm -hmm. our current situation, <clears throat> we need to recognize that the forces that are, are driving our current global civilization are coming apart. They're forcing it apart at the seams. Um, and Who that's is forcing it apart as it seems? Who? Sorry? You said they are forcing it apart as yeah, it seems. Yeah, the, the actual who's forces, um, things like growth, this growth imperative, or these incredible inequalities, or the okay. extraction of natural resources um, beyond any, uh, anything that makes any sense whatsoever. Right. All of these different things are driving our society to unravel, basically. That okay. It's coming apart at it seems.
And while that's, that's terrifying, and I certainly don't want things to come apart at their seams and, and all the suffering and misery that comes from that. But, one, but if we go back to that Aikido analogy, one of the things that we recognize from that is as that happens, the ties that bind that society together are unraveling. Mm -hmm. And just like if you just imagine a tightly woven cloth, and if you try to tear it, there's nothing you can do. So you say, okay, I need to like force, I need to take a knife and cut uh, to, uh, to uh, take it apart. But if that weave starts to unravel, then basically you don't need to do so much other than reweave. And this is the ultimate, to my mind, this is the ultimate challenge of of our of humanity in this century is okay. to reweave as it's coming apart, reweave a new society within the old society skillfully and rapidly enough so that it doesn't totally come apart to the point of total collapse and devastation for um, billions of people on this earth and for much of life on this earth, but actually do that reweaving inside it as it's coming apart. We know it's coming apart, so we don't need to spend so much of our time other than resisting destructive processes that kill people or destroy the earth. We have to resist that, yeah. absolutely. But for the most part, let those forces do their own uh, their own unraveling and focus our attention on weaving what is life affirming and positive in the spaces that they create through their own self destructive actions. Wow. That was such a powerful ending. Like when you mentioned Aikido, I instantly thought of the, the martial art of Brazil, known um, as Capoeira. Oh yeah, right. I, I think it's Kafar. Yeah. What amazed me with it, and Aikido as well, the way you actually described it is that it resembles a dance more than a martial art. And when we think of the political power plays, it really is how do we play along? How do we actually dance in all the mess that we have generated throughout the centuries? It shouldn't be difficult. It shouldn't be a struggle. It, it never should be a struggle because then we're obviously doing something wrong. It really, how do we learn how to dance? How do we learn these steps? And what are the, the steps that we have to take? It's, it was amazing. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, thank you, Anya, for what you just said. That was beautifully said. I, I, I love where you're going on that. And I do think that is very much about that. It's the dance, just like capoeira to uh we we, we got to dance our way to that new system to that and new and and i i love all that you all are saying and i'm here in the violence playing and all of that but if i was a slave on a plantation i don't think dancing would help me okay so i i think all these views are beautiful and important and yes there are different ways about going about certain things but and when things are really oppressed and, and there's real structural violence and physical violence on people. I don't know that this solution is, yeah. And, and you said it, German, you said, you know, there's some things that we have to resist. And so it's, how do we, I mean, it, it's really gonna take, you know, real wisdom on all of our parts everyone who is attempting to make a contribution here. We can't just jump up and say, oh, this is the right way. This is the only way we have to develop what you, know, you are talking about. And, and that is holding this tension um, between all of these relationships and understanding, doing the work to understand these interconnections and the relationships and how do we, I love where you're going with this, weave a, a, a better future. And um, yeah, and, wow. and that's a new possible that you are talking about. Yeah, and, and just uh, to finish just on one point, which is that sometimes, you know, somebody hearing me talk might feel, oh, I wish I were optimistic like uh, D Jeremy, as I, I look and I see how bad things are looking. I, d I don't wanna give you the sense that I actually am optimistic. I do see, I see only too clearly how devastating these drivers are and how difficult it is to turn these things around. Um, but I think the point is, is not to even 
uh, focus our attention too much on making some assessment of the, about the probabilities of the good happening or the bad happening, but to recognize this profound concept of hope, um, of um, that hope is not a matter of having a belief that the future will turn out well, but hope is a matter of just knowing that it is so important that we are engaged in this process. And it's really more like this kind of verb of being actively engaged in putting our energies into that possibility, no matter how slim, that possibility that there is this life-affirming future, this flourishing future available to us. That's what hope is, is, is about, is just putting that, that faith and commitment into that possibility and um, just going there each day and with millions of other people around. And that's, the, that's where the possibility happens to actually see that change. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I think you end on, on that.